It's WNYC in New York. I'm John Schaefer. Longtime listeners to this program, New Sounds, know that we've heard a lot of unusual recordings over the years, but this next one is really quite astonishing. It comes to us from a remarkable figure in 20th century Iranian music. His name is Ostad Elahi. <laughs> He never played in public. He never played on the radio. He never gave a concert. He was a kind of secret musician. A couple of his pieces were recorded through a door. He didn't even know the tape recorder was on. If we try to describe him in a few words, he was a thinker, a judge, and one of the most remarkable musicians of the 20th century. Il avait euh, des musiciens, des artistes, des philosophes de tous bords qui venaient, des gens tout simplement qui cherchaient quelque chose. The thing that surprised me, I think, the most about Ostad Alahi's music was the continuous understatedness of it, and yet my continuous interest in it. The feeling of one soul expressing something. That, to me, was the thing that kind of struck me the most in the basic sound world. It's not what we would traditionally think of as trance-inducing music, but it doesn't mean it couldn't also invoke a kind of altered state of consciousness. All of these things contribute to the brain's interpretation of what's going on, either conscious or unconscious. What's paradoxical about Ostad Elahi's music is that, on the one hand, it's continuous, not allowing for periods of silence, and yet the effect is to create a great silence within oneself. Sometimes a piece of music is just a piece of music. But sometimes a piece of music makes you want to know more. Who wrote this? Where did it come from? What was the intention? And maybe, why do I suddenly feel different than I did a few minutes ago? The music of Ostad Elahi poses these questions to an increasingly wider circle of listeners. So who was Ostad Elahi? Where did he come from? And how does the music of a man who never made a record or even played a concert spread from the hills of Northwest Iran to New York's Metropolitan Museum of Art? To answer that question, we have to go back to 1895 and the small town of Jehunabad, where Ostad Alahi was born. Jehunabad is in the heart of the Kurdish hills in Northwestern Iran a place known for its rich spiritual history and deep roots in age-old mystical traditions. Amongst the greatest achievements in the arts in Iran, one can count mystical poetry, illustrations to mystical manuscripts, and also the music. That culture was also rich in science and mathematics. Persian architecture was closely aligned with developments in geometry. Algebra, the modern numerical system. Early advances in astronomy and medicine all had roots in ancient Persia. What could be more perfect than standing here in the ancient Near Eastern Department at the Metropolitan Museum of Art to talk about the context from which Ostad Elahi found his inspiration and found his tradition. One remembers Rumi and his writings. Ostad Elahi's music is in many ways uh, comparable to Rumi's poetry. They both combine a mastery of aesthetic forms and deep spiritual inner experience. Their creations connect each person to the presence of the Divine Beloved. These kinds of aesthetics of spiritual awareness, of inspiration, all are part of the tradition that Ostad Elahi was coming from. Their house consisted of a few bedrooms and a small courtyard. Here, Ostad Elahi spent his childhood and adolescence in ascetic practices, music, 
and contemplation, along with his father, mother, and a few dervishes. His father, Hajj Namat, was a charismatic mystic and a prolific poet. He was also revered as a spiritual leader in the region. In addition, Hajj Namat was a virtuoso player of the tambour and a composer of music for that instrument. It's very difficult to imagine someone like Ustad Ilahi without the father he had. Haji Namat was outwardly a fairly normal landowning, which meant in those days fairly well-to-do Kurdish uh, villager in this region, educated, working as a scribe and an accountant and a manager and so forth, who experienced a sudden spiritual illumination of a kind that was fairly common in that part of the world. Ustad Allahi was just a, a kid, like five or six, when all this was happening. He was already dancing to the music and spinning around. Lui, dès son enfance, il était dans un milieu féerique et, et mystique extraordinaire. It was an idyllic life. Ostad Elahi recalled what joyous times were those times. What a joyous atmosphere indeed. We were constantly praying and singing hymns without any idea of what was happening in the outside world. Very early on, around age five, Elahi started to play the tanbor. There was no instrument small enough, so his father had a tanbor made for him out of a wooden ladle. It wasn't long before the youngster began to show an extraordinary musical gift. À l'âge de 9 ans, les tambouristes disaient on ne peut plus rien lui apprendre, c'est lui notre maître et on préfère se taire et l'écouter. Donc à 9 ans, il maîtrisait déjà l'ensemble. C'est vraiment l'enfant prodige. Quoi. He would spend the entire night playing the tambour, from dusk until dawn. There was no electricity in his village back then, and he said he had to learn how to change the tambour strings in the dark. His father was a mystic, attracted many people from various regions. And I think he picked up ideas, certainly melodies, perhaps playing techniques that he saw. His father used to tiptoe behind the door, listening to his music. It was the first sign of the uncanny effect that Allahi's music could have on his listeners. But this idyllic life ended in 1920, when Hajj Namat passed away. Ostad Allahi later wrote about how difficult it was to lose his father. Not only was he my father and guide, but we also shared a unique spiritual bond. He would inherit his father's lands, his musical instruments and manuscripts, and eventually, his role as a spiritual leader. But the young man began to look at his centuries-old family tradition in a new light. In the late 1920s and early 1930s, the Western world was going through turbulent times. But the forces of Westernization and modernization were spreading, especially in Tehran. Elahi made several trips to that city during this period. And eventually moved there. Elahi's apparent break with tradition was symbolized by a simple but startling act. Sometime in his 30s, Elahi cut his hair and his beard. 
he replaced his traditional robes with a Western-style suit. In 1933, he entered the newly formed National School of Jurisprudence. The following year, he embarked on a judicial career that would span some 23 years. He wasn't just a judge. I mean, he was really working in the Ministry of Justice at the time that the nation of Iran was really being created as a modern nation state. So he was involved in sort of in the setting up of a new system of law which would take the place of the local tribal and regional laws and systems all over the country. Reza Shah had just assumed power and was intent on modernizing the country of Iran. It was in a difficult transitional period between its patchwork quilt of feudal systems and tribal laws to something more modern and westernized. Instead of going into sort of spiritual seclusion, he went into kind of another world where nobody would expect him to be a judge, a prosecutor, to be a, somebody who's out in the legal profession, traveling around the country with enormous responsibilities. The people who knew his father must have been mystified. In many spiritual traditions, there's a notion that the highest form of service and of spiritual devotion takes place not from walling oneself off from the world and becoming an aromatic, but by joining it, by being in the world. In pursuing a live mysticism, uh, one that is in tune with the lives and the psychological and spiritual demands of the people of the time, in that sense, he broke away from tradition and clearly created some antagonism within the environment he was in. Ostad, he said, the spirituality, the ethics, is a problem individual between soi and the source. He became known as a very fair, very wise magistrate. He was a bit controversial because he didn't constantly side with the landowners, and as a result, was moved from place to place throughout Iran. Putting the spiritual and ethical principles he had learned from his father into practice in the real world was a challenge. In fact, Elahi wrote that one year in government service had more spiritual value than 12 years of ascetic practice back in Jehunabad. It's a harder path to do that than to become a recluse and really give your whole mind and heart in that way to God or whatever your pursuit is. But to do it at the same time and keep it alive and integrated with real living is actually the ultimate example. There's no worry where he says there's something wrong with that traditional kind of life that I've read about. He simply says it's not particularly effective <laughs> if you compare it to a life spent in society with the challenges of society that you're going to learn a lot more from trying to keep an even spiritual keel, from trying to keep a balanced spiritual life while you're participating in society than you will if you spend it in a life withdrawn from all the temptations and challenges of social life. Throughout nearly a quarter century as a judge, he would continue to play the mystical music that he had immersed himself in during his childhood. But it was a personal connection, not a public one. He would play only at home for family and friends. Souvent c'était pour lui seul, mais de temps en temps, il jouait pour nous, pour ses enfants, ses proches. Bahram Elahi made a few home recordings of his father's music. Initially, most of the recordings were done from the other side of the door. A striking echo of how Ostad Elahi's own father, Haj Nimat, listened to Ostad play when he was still a child. Alors, c'est fait dans des conditions un peu difficiles. Parfois, on mettait le microphone euh, sous la porte. Mon frère cadet, Chorov, un jour, il avait, je crois, 13, 14 ans. Il a dit, je veux t'apprendre le tambour. Vraiment, il hérite le plus de ce, la musique d'Ostad que nous tous. In teaching the young Sharok to play his music, Ostad Elahi was helping to ensure that the music would live on. He could not have known how widely its influence would expand, eventually reaching the singer Parisa, 
the great classical vocalist often referred to as the Maria Callas of Iran. همیشه فکر میکردم که دیگه واقعا کسی خواهد بود که اینجوری تنبور بزنه و این موسیقی رو به گوش نسل های بعدی برسونه و به نظرم میامد که شاید غیر ممکن باشه ولی بعدها خوشبختانه متوجه شدیم که این موسیقی منتقل شده به دکتر شاهروخ الهی به سرشون و یاد این شعر مولانا افتادم که چون که گل رفت و گلستان شد خراب بوی گل را آغاز که جوییم از گلاب و من خوشحالم که این گلاب وجود داره و عطر اون گل را به مشام ما هنوز میرسه When the roses are gone and the garden is ruined, where do you find the perfume of the rose? In the rose water. The tambour is a very old instrument. Going back to at least 5,000 years ago in Mesopotamia, it's a simple instrument, but it's a powerful instrument and actually is, in a way, an icon of being sacred. This 19th century tambour belonged to Ostad Allahi's father, Haj Namad. The instrument's face is in need of repair. For Ostad Elahi's family, the tanbor was more than just a musical device. It was part of a spiritual heritage. For most of us, the instrument remains a mystery. Although the tambour is an unfamiliar instrument, I think there's elements of Elahi's passionate approach that we can understand pretty fast. We can connect with that. What he did was try to standardize the proportions of the instrument. And he has some writings where he recommends how the instrument should be made in, in, with the correct proportions. Part of Elahi's involvement with his instrument was to make a subtle but important addition. The traditional tanbor had two strings, one for the drone and one for the melody. Elahi added an extra string and detuned it slightly from its twin. And this slight difference of pitch creates uh, beating tones between the two strings. There's a whole harmonic architecture. He can use these two strings together or separately and actually finger them. And the other string singly that also can be fingered with the thumb, which is one of his innovations. Mon père, c'était le premier à utiliser les cinq doigts pour avoir dissonance et surtout l'effet polyphonique. Not just the phrasing, but the rhythmic structures are kind of quite sophisticated. They're, they're repeating each other very asymmetrically and coming to rests in moments which you don't necessarily expect. It draws one into the sound and paradoxically creates within that sound a great silence within oneself. And it sustains 
that dual state of sound and silence interacting, the silence now and again coming to the front, coming to the fore, and then receding. This recording of Ostad Elahi has very little actual silence in it, but in the field of psychoacoustics, which studies how sound affects the brain, Ostad Elahi's music has attracted a fair amount of attention, both for its ability to suggest silence while playing continuously, and for its unusual sound, which is far richer than you might expect from such a simple instrument. I was fascinated by the harmonic structure of the sound and by the complexity of the sound, given that it was all produced by one man and one tambour. It was absolutely fascinating to me. So after a little bit of listening, I actually went into the studio and did a spectral analysis of the music. And that's the technology that we use to look at sound in real time. And as we spectrally analyzed the music of Ostad Elahi, we saw very similar properties to that of Mozart and of Haydn. Ostad Elahi's compositions, in particular in the high frequencies, which are all overtones, we see very similar characteristics in terms of the harmonic pattern uh, and the complexity of the overtones that are present within the music. As a sound engineer, uh, I was proposed to work on the old tapes of Ostadelai recorded in the 60s. I did, as usual, when you are remastering, you take frequencies of the sound, you just adjust to be clean. So I cut frequencies and I didn't understand what I heard. I said, all the magic was disappeared. And when I talked after with Charles Lai, he said, don't cut this. This is a magic part of the tambour. This frequency you hear, it comes because Rostad Lai played like this. He's ornamenting with both hands. You know, the left hand is flicking the strings and running around the strings. His right hand is doing this kind of fluttering dragonfly thing all over the strings. Here, one of the interesting features is what I would call an arabesque style of ornamentation. In other words, a continuing uh, pattern that propels itself forward using repetitive but slightly changing melodic patterns. One of the things that one notices if you listen is it's almost obsessive in the way that it repeats itself internally in different lengths. So a little motivic fragment within a melodic line will then repeat itself almost immediately at a slightly different length, smaller or longer. And that variety keeps you constantly slightly off kilter, even though what you're hearing sounds very kind of fluid and smooth. And so it keeps the phrase very buoyant and interesting and surprising too. There's a complex interaction between the harmonics uh, produced by the two strings. Uh, beating tones, summation tones, and it's really uh, this rich, dense harmonic field that's creating the acoustic interest and the impact. There are many things which are in common with uh, Ustad Allahi's music, with Western music, that people could naturally kind of gravitate towards. One is the sense of having a solid pitch, a drone reference point. So people, I think, could get that right from the bat. But there are a lot of things which I think would seem a little bit different for a Western ear. A lot of the ornamentation feels very florid, and, and a lot of uh, Western music is kind of distilled and kind of compressed into very kind of simple lines. And so you don't get the kind of internal ornamentation that you get in Allahi's music, for example, in the middle of a line where he'll just be holding a note and you'll have a, some fluctuation of the pitch in between. A lot of the endings of the phrases kind of fall off, you know, and they have almost kind of a sigh.
And this is very different. Most Western music is very kind of blunt at the end of the phrases or very kind of square. Neuroscientists have been eager to learn what happens in the brains of listeners who've grown up with Western music, whether classical or popular, when they're exposed to something like Elahi's music. In a sense, it's like listening to a foreign language that we don't understand. By the age of five years old, any human infant has learned the rules and the structure of the music, and the language for that matter, that it's brought up in. The developing child starts to selectively prune out those neural connections that it didn't need. Maybe neural connections it would have used for Persian music, Chinese opera, for Amazonian rainforest music. If the child was born here isn't the issue, it's what the child listens to. And after the age of 10 or 12, it becomes very difficult to learn the rules of another system, as difficult as it is for an adult to learn a second spoken language. When we listen to music, which we're familiar with, where there is certain predictable patterns and rhythms, then our left brain is preferentially activated. And conversely, in more mystical aspects of music, in which pattern recognition is not readily available, and that surprises are dotted through the composition, this will preferentially activate the right hemisphere of our brains. Ostad Elahi was not a neuroscientist, but like many great musicians over the centuries, he seems to have instinctively understood that novelty, playing something unexpected, could produce a startling effect in his listeners, perhaps a heightened state of awareness or sharpening of the senses. It's been suggested that maybe musicians, you know, pre-literate culture musicians even, somehow short-circuited their way to this scientific knowledge that we now have. But that's, of course, what artists have been doing all along. Artists have figured out ways to exploit the perceptual apparatus that evolution gave us. When Ostad Elahi's family and friends spoke of being entranced by his music, they didn't mean falling into a glassy-eyed trance. They meant finding themselves strongly focused. Because of the tempo changes, in particular, in Elahi's music, it's not what we would traditionally think of as trance-inducing music, where the tempo has to stay the same. It doesn't mean it couldn't also invoke a kind of altered state of consciousness. It's just that the mechanism by which it did that isn't as clear, because that type of thing has been relatively less studied. Uh, one of the most remarkable aspects about our brains is this concept of plasticity. So this concept of how experience actually shapes and sculptures our brain function uh, is widely accepted amongst neuroscientists at this point. And certainly music and exposure to uh, various types of music not only can change the function of the brain, but also can change the actual structure of the brain as well. He was very much aware of what he was doing in keeping people's uh, immediate attention focused on the present of these kind of small substructures in the phrase. So when you're listening to this music and you're constantly being kind of interrupted and, and challenged with the length of these smaller groupings within the bigger phrase, you can't help but be alert. Certainly music can induce a kind of hyper vigilant or hyper conscious state where you're you're not out of it, but you're more in it than usual, more focused, more responsive, sort of in a peak state. This is the state that super athletes, Olympic athletes are in, that an improviser is in, a painter, somebody who's at the top of their game, and music can promote this, although through means that we don't fully understand. We can talk about how Allahi might have used his music to create this heightened state of awareness in his mind and in his listeners, but it's more difficult to talk about why. Was this effect intentional, or was it a byproduct of the music's deep spiritual and mystical roots? I don't know to what extent a kind of a teleological question is justified, but one can ask nonetheless, what is the purpose of that? Well, the purpose of that may be to somehow combine in the same experience both the trance-like devoid of frontal lobe presence and the rational infused with frontal low presence into the same experience, which is a pretty ambitious enterprise.
For Elahi, improvisation was the essence of his music, the way to bridge the worlds of the trance state and the rational, the familiar and the unfamiliar. He's an exciting improviser because he just works away at a particular phrase and the ornaments are flying out at high speed and he's developing an idea here and another one there and then he'll suddenly bring in a chord unexpectedly. Real beautiful works of art and music are able to engage both aspects of our brain function, the world of the known and the world of the unknown. Ostad maintained contact with a number of Iranian musicians and studied with the great musical masters of his time. Eventually, he synthesized classical Persian music into the traditional repertoire of the tanbor. He would occasionally play for small groups of family and friends, but as a musician, he was almost completely unknown. That began to change in 1960 when one of the musicians who heard him play wrote about his experience in a magazine article. One of the people who read that article was the man credited with saving traditional Persian music in the 1970s, the musicologist Darish Safat. Marufi's article lamented the poor state of music on the radio in Iran and compared it to the extraordinary music of an unnamed judge who played the tanbor and whose music had a profound impact. Bahare 1339, Marhum Ustad Musa Marufi Musa Khan, ishun maqale nevishtan dar bare musiqi va musiqidan. Goftan in yek ke bozorgavari ast ke shakhsiyat bozorgi va qazi علی رتبه دادگستری بودن و ایشون بازنشسته هستن و مایل نیستن که اسم ایشون رسن مطرح شد. Marufi told Dr. Safat that Allahi's music put him in a transcendent state of mind. I was in a state, Marufi said, where I was not bound by time or space. I had a feeling of being in a peak state, filled with love and compassion. Safat sought out Elahi and would later say that Elahi was the single biggest influence on his life and work. That work included founding the Center for Preservation and Propagation of Iranian Music, where some of Iran's greatest musicians were exposed to Elahi's music, including the singer Parisa. خوشبختانه این شانس رو داشتم که با دکتر دایش سفد آشنا بشم 
که خب ایشون هم نوازنده ستار بودن و مرکز حسای شاهر رو ایشون تحسیص کرده بودن من رو آشنا کردن با موسیقی استاد و اینکه اصلا موسیقی با چه کیفیتی داشته باشه آشنا شدم با اندیشه های استاد و موسیقی استاد من In the late 1960s, the Shiraz Persepolis International Arts Festival began taking place. That brought Western artists, musicians, and intellectuals to Iran, and opened the country up to many Europeans for the first time. Some of the world's most famous actresses, like Elizabeth Taylor or Ellen Burstyn, and international figures like the Kennedys were among the Westerners who visited Iran around this time. The area around the city of Shiraz was a hub of cultural and artistic exchange. Ostad Allahi, true to form, was not a part of the scene. He stayed at home, continuing to play his music for his family and some close friends and the occasional visitor. But word of his playing traveled fast, and a number of visiting artists made their way to see him. Among them was the internationally famous violinist Yehudi Menuhin. Jamais je n'ai eu pendant au moins une demi-heure une expérience musicale qui, qui ne bougeait pas, euh, qui ne dépassait pas la carte. Et une musique très, très sensible, très intense, mais aussi euh, très précise et très pure. Another visitor was the great French choreographer Maurice Béjar. Il ne parlait pas français. Je ne parlais pas iranien. Il a joué pour moi. J'ai dansé sur cette musique et ça m'a vraiment euh, ouvert quelque chose. Mais je peux pas dire avec des mots ce que. Euh, non, ce que j'ai vécu, ressenti, ce qui est, est que ça, ça a été quand même un, un très grand changement dans ma, dans ma vie, dans mon existence et dans ma pensée. Ostad Elahi spent most of his retirement with his family and people who came from various places to visit him. He authored several books based on his research, experience, and philosophy. These works were, in many ways, informed by his early life as a mystic and his later work as a jurist. They reflect a distinctly personal approach to questions about purpose, and meaning, and self-awareness. What he could say in words, he did. What he could not say in words, he said through his music. Je n'ai pas un souvenir plus, disons, marquant que l'autre. Je ne peux pas, par exemple, vous dire tel souvenir était meilleur que l'autre. Par contre, je pourrais dire mon pire souvenir, c'était lorsqu'il il a quitté ce monde et après je me suis trouvé vraiment orphelin sur le plan musical. Ça, je pourrais dire. He passed away in 1974 in his house in Tehran with his family and a few friends around him. He was 79. Two decades after his death, Ostad Elahi finally made a record. 
a series of them, in fact, as the home recordings made by his son Bahram were released on the French Chant du Monde label. It was 1995, the centennial of Allahi's birth. I've watched with fascination as more and more people in unlikely walks of life began to discover his music. After the recordings came the museum exhibitions, the Musée de la Musique in Paris, and the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. The Sacred Lute, the Art of Ostad Elahi, opened in New York in August of 2014. As museum exhibits go, it was modest in size, but it proved to be a surprising success, drawing over 100,000 visitors and attracting media attention from around the world, including the New York Times and PBS. Iranian-born musician, and philosopher Ostad Elahi lived from 1895 to 1974. During his lifetime, the, the exhibition included Elahi's own manuscripts and instruments and the live performance of Ostad Elahi's music by his son Sharak in the museum's auditorium. musical experiences to be taken away with some kind of soaring quality that you've never experienced before. That's why we listen to music. These pieces are meant to connect you with a different part of yourself that otherwise would be less accessible. I think it was the first thing I heard, this uh, yellow shahi suite. This is still the one I go back to. It's a really great long exploration. He was playing the March of the Angels, following the beat of their march. And this music so beautifully represents the dynamic interface between order and chaos, between light and dark. And to have all these components in a composition of music really represents the apex of creativity and human consciousness. Persian works of art, especially those with a mystical dimension, have mirror-like qualities. The idea is to achieve self-knowledge and to transform oneself, becoming better and wiser human beings. It is really to be understood as mystical poetry, and that means that there are meanings. One can attain them, one can reach them through a kind of mystical understanding. He basically believed something from which the music flowed. And that kind of basic way of approaching music, I think, is fantastic. At first, you think 
Is this Iranian classical music? Is it some kind of folk music from the Middle East? And I gradually realized uh, it was a completely unique, very personal take on everything he'd heard through his life and the process of this complete involvement with his instrument, the tambour. And let's not forget that he was playing this music for a few people in a room. He had no idea that I would be listening to this music in Toronto 30 years after his death and that he would be inspiring people around the world. You go to Elahi for a kind of uh, spiritual depth in the music, an utter commitment to his own vision on that instrument. We can be filled with music, but in order to communicate it, in order to share it, we have to actually learn to play. And uh, from Mostad's point of view, life is really about learning to play the instrument of the soul. Il disait toujours, la musique est en rapport direct avec l'âme, et l'âme direct avec le créateur de l'âme. There's literally another world there above the fundamental vibrating uh, sounds of the strings that you can completely miss. And in life, we can walk around and look at the surface of things and we can miss a lot of things that are going on. The fact that he decided to change his life course so dramatically and, of course, keep music essentially as a core part of that and move into his life as a judge and engaging the world, so to speak, is also extremely admirable. Well, that means that anybody, any of us, has no excuse. <laughs> you know? That basically, whatever you're doing, it's that integrated approach to life which engages the world, but it's also part of you know, who you are deeply as an artist. What Ostad Elahi's life shows us is that when we look back at the historical accounts or the mythical accounts of the great sages of the past and sometimes wonder to ourselves, could such an extraordinary person have really lived and walked this earth? The answer has to be yes, because here's one of them who was recently among us. Thank mm -hmm. you.